Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, drummer for NBC's The Voice, Nate Morton. And now, Rich Redman. is up out there in podcast land. Yep, it's that time. Another exciting edition of the Rich Redmond Show where we talk about all things music, motivation, and success to all sorts of creative people, actors, authors, comedians, thought leaders, even drummers. So many drummers. We got three drummers on this oh, Zoom gosh. call right now. Jim McCarthy, Jim McCarthy, voiceovers.com coming to us from Music City, USA. Jim, what's up, man? Oh, you know, the usual, just working and more, more working. Yeah. And working some more. Well, you pull it off, I'm man. You, you, you're a man of, of many talents. You're a renaissance man, and you're feeding a large family, and I always give you props on that. And I just, before we jump into this episode, Jim, I just wanted to publicly thank everybody out there in the worldwide web land for just supporting our show. This was a crazy idea that you and I had about a year and a half ago. We've known each other for 13 years at least. Um, many times you act as my male muse. You sit on my shoulder. You encourage me. We finally found a great outlet for you and I to kind of like put our thing together. And I just want to thank everybody publicly for just getting on board with this and supporting the show. There's so many podcasts out there. Mark Marin was b bragging that he had the number 20th the 20th most popular or downloaded podcast of 2020. Of course, he's been at it for like 15 years or so. So just the fact that we've got about 105, 106 episodes and you guys ravenously consume this. It's not a huge audience, but you guys that are there, you're ravenous. And I just want to thank, thank you for the support. Don't you think it's a cool thing? What he said. <laughs> Okay, man. Yeah. Well, Will that work? Totally. Yeah. Totally. So let's get into this. <laughs> I wanted to get this gentleman on the show for a long, long time. I mean, he's been on the list since day one, but he's so busy. And scheduling this show is kind of like herding cats. It is such a difficult thing, but we made it happen. I've known this young man for about a decade. So accomplished, top Angelino drummer. And you know him because he's been invading your living room as the house drummer for NBC's The Voice for the last 10 years. Our friend Nate Moore. Gordon, what's up, buddy? Hello, Sir Rich Redmond. I was actually uh, fixated. I was still just, I was picturing Jim sitting on your shoulder. <laughs> and so I kind of stuck there. You said that, yeah, and then my brain just froze. My brain like froze, like freeze frame of Jim sitting on your shoulder, and that's what's been on my mind the whole time well, sitting here. I mean, the funny thing is, is that's kind of like where the muse sits. You know, usually there's sure. like a, I picture the muse and she's, you know, she looks like a little kind of like a, like a, like a little fairy with like little wings and she's okay, really. Okay, so now I'm picturing Jim dressed as a fairy. <laughs> and we're talking like a Dungeons and Dragons type fairy yeah. and she kind of whispers. No, oh, yeah. no, not like a Tinkerbell type fairy? It's <laughs> like, like a. A skirt and a magic dust wand and all yes, that stuff. Yes, that that. And then and then but then now now Jim, you I'm um, sorry, Rich, you've also got me picturing uh, Jim dressed both as an angel on one shoulder, or as the devil on the older, other shoulder. Yes. So I'm just you're just creating all kinds of crazy imagery for me right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, if you guys are consuming this with your ears, you're not seeing that Nate is, is uh, taking this interview from his man cave, his drum cave, and uh, I think it's Valencia, man. I love it. You know, it's life of it's good out there, man. The sun is shining, um, and we were, we were comparing the sizes of our man caves, but it looks great, man. There's drums everywhere. There's drums everywhere. This is, this is, this, yeah, this is definitely my, my hang, you know? Uh, it's funny, I, I'm reminded of the uh, comedian whose name is failing me right now, who says that when he was a kid, his dad didn't have a man cave because his dad's man cave was the whole house. <laughs> Whereas now, oh. now we have recently been, you know, as, as dudes that we get relegated. Like, I have the whole rest of the house, and then here's your room, Nate. <laughs> That's yes. my wife. You know, my wife talking to me would say, here's mm -hmm. the room that you live in. Jim, do you know that comedian? Can you name Manis that? Manis I do not. Maniscalco? Sebastian Maniscalco. Yeah, yeah, yeah Sebastian Maniscalco. <laughs> He's like one of the top comedians in the world right now. He's so good. Yeah. yeah. He really is. So uh, this, through all this madness that it's been happening that we've been talking about for the last year, does has the show uh, been trucking on or like I haven't watched it in a little bit? 
Uh, Rich, remarkably, yes, the show has been trucking on. In fact, I'll I'll try to put it sort of briefly. Yeah. But essentially, when this all started back in March 2020, yeah. uh, well, it, it started prior to March 2020, but the, the nationwide shutdowns and so on started happening March 2020. Sure. We were actually in the middle of a season 18 hiatus. Like, we were in the middle of a break that occurs normally in our season production. So... I was already planning to have no work at that point, at least not on the show. And the silver lining is that they get, that gave us a little bit of lead time before we had to be back. So in that little amount of lead time, three weeks, four weeks, the, the, the brains, you know, the brain trust of the operation went into overdrive and figured out a way to record the season and finish it out remotely, which is what we did. So we finished season 18 remotely from our homes. I recorded the finale and, and, and so on right here on that drum kit behind me. Wow. And uh, yeah, and um, and then there was another break between 18 and 19, during which time they sort of figured out, okay, how can we get back in a room together and safely do this and safely create content? So that's yeah. what's been going on since season 19. And incidentally, we are now in that same season 19 hiatus that we were in the middle of the season Sorry, season 20. We're in production on season 20 at this point. Oh, my gosh. Incredible. But we're already working, yes. But we're in the middle of the, that same break that occurs um, that occurred the last time that enabled us to go back. So, anyway, yes. Well, and I, and I, and I, know, I know that you worked hard to get, the, to get that job. Um, and, but, you know, it's, it's so funny when I look at something like that. I say to myself, wow, this is a great situation because not only is it a secure job, you're playing, you're on national TV. I'm assuming it's connected to at a great pay scale, connected with SAG after. But then you have to go do all those recordings that you would do in Burbank for the artists, right? And well, I was we like, don't, oh, we that's don't. a bucket of work. Well, we don't, we don't, we don't have to, we get to, get you know to. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I was, you know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't mean to be snarky. It's just, that's the way I look at everything, man. I look at everything that I was on the phone one day with my buddy, Reggie Hamilton. He's a bass player. Oh, yeah. And we were chatting and I was in my hotel room and I was in, I was in Vegas at the time. It was during my work with, um, with Cher. Awesome. And at one point I said to, to Reggie, I said, Hey Reggie, uh, I got to go, man. Cause I have to go downstairs so I can walk over to Caesars and do this gig tonight with Cher. And he said, get to, and I said, huh? He said, you get to go downstairs and walk over and do this gig at Caesars Palace with Cher. Nice. And I've, I've never forgotten it. I've, that, that, that has stuck in my head forever. So I, at this point, I never say I have to. I say I get to because, you know, even in times like, there are times, speaking of recording, there are times when we've recorded an entire day, right? Let's say we've worked an entire day. Let's say we're finally wrapping. It's 11 o'clock at night, 12 o'clock at night. Something happens. Oh, um, you guys, can you possibly record the original artist, you know, the original song for this particular contestant on the show? And rather than thinking, oh, man, really? We have to record. It's 12 o'clock. I have to record it. I think to myself, I get to record it. You know, it, it, totally. it gets me through a lot. You know, so it's a, it's a showmanism. It's a showmanism. You know, we're all such positive guys and it's just such a, you know, our circle of guys, you know, because you having worked with um, Cher, Shulman had a long time gig also, you yeah. know, uh, with, and then uh, Sutter's doing it now. So it's just a small group of guys, incredible A-list drummers, man, that, you know, it's, it's super small world. I love it. You know, I think we've played the show um, two or three times. One of the first times for us was terrifying because it was pre-drum tech for me. It was the early days. And I had some drums delivered from whatever the rental place was in town. And there was typical story, really bad traffic that morning. The drums didn't really make it in time. And when they showed up, they were so out of tune. It was like, you know, it was like summer or something. It was like, Rah! and you know, all the guys, all the stagehands who I know these guys, because you know, in TV, all the guys that are doing people's choice, Grammys, ACMs, all, they're right. all the same guys. And so they're like, Rich, we're ready for you. We're ready for sounds. I'm like, guys, the drums just showed up. They, and I, I, but I got it together. Thank God I kept my cool. I was like, guys, give me 10 minutes. I'll have this ready for you. And so that was really fun. The next time we came, it was a lot easier because I was just playing brushes on a kick and snare. Mm, and you left, you, left, you left a sexy little note for me on a paper plate. That's back when I guess there was catering and stuff and all those. <laughs> I don't even know what I wrote. What did I write? You're right. You're something like, you're sexy, have a great show, or something like that. Oh, that sounds, that sounds very nice. I was, I, was being, I, was, I was being welcoming. I was you welcoming you into, into our home. Yes. <laughs> you never do that for me. 
But it, but it's great. So what's a typical work day for you when you guys are all on site and doing the thing together? What like for the guys that just and you've done a lot of television shows. You've done a lot of those, uh, the rock star in excess, the rock star supernova. Uh, I think when I Bonnie met Hunt you, show. I met you Bonnie on Bonnie Hunt, Hunt which was yeah. crazy because um, we, our song "She's Country" had just come out. This was two thousand and nine, I believe. And mm-hmm. LA's perception of a country rock band coming through is they set up hay bales and wagon wheels, and the and the song was like. Ah, on, on, drop D guitar and there's like wagon wheels and we're like okay here we go <laughs> well uh, oh, she's yeah, country. I, I, don't, yeah. I, don't, I don't even know what to say about that I mean well, I Jason Jason is sort of he was on sort of the leading edge of that though wasn't he yeah I mean wasn't he sort of one of those first I mean I don't want to get I don't want to talk out of turn because God knows that country is not my forte per se but <laughs> he was sort of one of those first dudes really marrying like yeah. new rock and country was he yeah not? yeah my god it's it's uh, you know it's it's exhausting looking back and we've been together 21 years it's like nuts you know I mean, so she's country she's country is basically a rock song i'm hearing it in my head is there a banjo on that because you because you've played it yeah there's probably there might be a banjo buried in there somewhere yeah i think there's a banjo on it is there is there is there steel on it oh yeah there's there's steel buried in there <laughs> okay. okay yeah because that's what a lot of, to me, that's what a lot of country is now, is like basically rock with fiddle and, and banjo and, 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 and steel. And they don't even you know? have fiddle anymore. And it was like, so fiddle is, you know, I don't even know what the really? steel, I don't know what the fiddle players in Nashville are doing. I really don't know. It's like extended unemployment. Or I have no idea what they're doing because it's not on well, the recordings anymore. Well, and it's because Janelle, oh, sorry, it's because Janae Fleener has all the gigs. <laughs> it's because Janae doesn't leave any room for anyone else to work. Yeah, well, the, yards. <laughs> well, the thing is, is Jim, you've seen Nate play total command of the instrument can play any style. So you are a country drummer. You're an R&B drummer. You're a folk drummer. You're a fusion drummer. You're an odd meter progressive guy. A lot of your, your gigs outside of the television gigs, you got to show your versatility. I mean, the first, one of the first things I saw you was doing the Paul Stanley gig. And I was like, this guy is a hard swatting rock drummer. And then you had the, you know, the stick where you would toss it up and grab it and never miss a beat and you were twirling and I was like I can get along with this guy he probably has a couple of haters from the twirling but who cares because Paul Stanley probably loved it <laughs> well you know and I don't I don't even know if I have haters from twirling or not maybe I do maybe I don't I try not to even you know I just do what I do that I enjoy exactly and uh, I, I don't really worry about anything else besides that yeah well, if you have the haters, you know, Jim will remind me. He's like, you have haters, you're doing something right because you're just unabashedly approaching your life and doing what you do and serving the music. And, but yeah, you're an everything drummer, man. And, and you know, it's... Well, it's, I'm it's, flattered it's, that you think so. Thanks, Rich. I mean, <laughs> that's, always been, that's always been a goal of mine. It's always been a goal. Sort of the guys that I love, two of the guys who are on my Rushmore of drummers are Vinny Kaliuta and Omar Hakim. There and they're go. both there in great part because as I was coming up, I felt as though these were a couple of guys who could basically do anything, Yeah, you know? Um, so yeah, that's always been a sort of an aspiration. And I've been fortunate to be put in situations that enable me to sort of, you know, I was explaining to someone just this morning that one of my first gigs out of college was playing weddings with a Calypso band, you know? And then on alternate weekends, I was playing hard rock with a cover band. And then every Tuesday and Sunday morning, I was playing jazz brunch on a you know Boston Harbor uh, little cruise line, little brunch cruise line. So nice. Yeah, you know, I've I've always sort of that's always been my goal is to be able to sort of feel comfortable in a variety of settings. So yeah, for me, I was I call it the Greg Bissonette model, where you like you can he could play Friends, he could play Satriani, he could play with Tanya Maria, he could you know like and he did, and it's like that right. was that was the model for me. Um, yeah, and you pulled it off. Uh, what Speaking of your 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 background, was, was it Berkeley? Uh huh. Did Berkeley you graduate? I did. I love I did. it because we just had Todd Zuckerman. Todd Zuckerman on his episode dropped today, and he's like, "Yeah, I was in the one year club." You know, I didn't. You know, I didn't right. Think. Well, a lot of people. You know, it's funny. I actually have a funny story about that, which I, I've told before. So if anyone's ever heard me tell a story before, I apologize. You can take this <laughs> opportunity to go get a you know a drink out of the fridge or something, but. So I was there. So first of all, I need to start with the ba- with the background that my father is a lifelong student, but also a lifelong educator. So my dad has an undergrad degree 
at least one, and I think two, master's degrees, a doctorate degree, and then actually did a postdoctoral study at Harvard University. Um, wow. He's retired now. He's a retired uh, college administrator. Good for but him. The, 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 so, so my dad, I always explain to people, if anyone who's watching or listening doesn't know what a postdoc is, a postdoctoral study is basically school for people who have run out of all the school that there is to do. Like, <laughs> you've, got, you've got a undergrad, a master's, a doctorate degree, and yet you still want more school? Well, here's a postdoctoral study for you. So that's what my dad did. So, so Cornell Morton, who went through all of that, my dad, you know, I mean, you think he's going to let a kid not graduate college? Oh, no, yeah, my dad, him, yeah, my dad said, you're first, going. Him, him being a first-generation college student himself, yeah. Right. So you think that he, you think he's going to let that begin and end with him? No, of course not. So it was it was definitely like, I want you to finish school. Right. I don't want the train to end here uh, or the streak to end here. So take that dovetail it into this. I'm in my sixth or so semester at Berkeley and we've just had a bunch of clinicians come. And one of the clinicians who came was Dennis Chambers, who is a hero. Yeah. So. I wrote Dennis, this tells you how long ago that was, right? I didn't email him. I didn't text him. I wrote Dennis, like actually physically wrote him a letter. Um, and I said, my name's Nate. You just did a clinic at Berkeley. I saw you. I was in the audience. You're amazing. You're my hero. Blah, 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 blah. Probably not going to be able to finish out school because I'm running out of, uh-oh, I lost you. Sorry. Oh, we're still, we're still seeing you great and hearing you. Oh, well, that's good. Well, then I'll just finish my story. Um <laughs> So I was basically just saying, probably not going to be able to finish school because, you know, I'm kind of running out of scholarship money and you know, of his advice. And he, so, so literally cut to, it's about seven in the morning, knock on my door. Poof, 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 poof. It's my roommate, Bill. I go, what? It's like seven, in the, it's, I'm, I'm in college. It's seven in the morning. I probably went to bed an hour before this, right? <laughs> right. So he's knocking on my door and I go, what? And he goes, it's the telephone for you. And I go, who, who is it? And he goes, okay, who is it, please? Yeah, okay. Dennis Chambers. <laughs> and I go, I go, I go, screw you. Like, who is it, Bill? And he goes, no, dude, it's actually Dennis Chambers. And so I open the door, and Bill hands me the phone like this. <laughs> Was he a drummer, too? And I go, no, but, 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 but who doesn't know who, like, and who, who at a music college doesn't know who Dennis Chambers is? Sure. Bill, Bill was a bass player, and... Um, Music production major. Long story short, I have a conversation with Dennis Chambers that morning, and Dennis basically says, you've spent so much time and so much energy and so much of your life at that school, it would be a real shame for you to walk away without the piece of paper. Nice. And so combine those two things. Combine my dad basically like hell-bent on me graduating college, and then Dennis Chambers, one of my heroes, calling me to tell me to finish school. So, yeah, I was not a, I was not a one and done or a, you know early yeah. – evacuator i was definitely there for the whole duration so nate i, I did you i saw so, somewhere aren't you originally from nashville uh you know so rich i don't know if i would say that i'm from nashville like yeah. if someone were to ask me where i'm from nashville is not usually my answer um however i was born there oh, okay, i was gotcha. born there and i don't say I, I mean don't get me wrong i have no issue with nashville i think nashville is a wonderful city it's just that usually when i'm a musician of course and and they and i say i'm from nashville they go oh cool man uh do you know so and so and so and i'm like well i left when i was eight <laughs> <laughs> that's me so I, I wasn't yeah. i wasn't oh. exactly like big on the scene at the time so um but yeah i was born at meharry general hospital in nashville and then i lived i lived in nashville until i was about six and then from about six to eight years old i lived uh, no i lie until i was about seven and then from about eight to 10 years old. There we go. I lived on my grandfather's farm, which is actually in Gordonsville, Tennessee, or was in Gordonsville, yeah. Tennessee. You don't even know where that is, do you? No, it's, I'm sure it's like out, out and there's banjos. There's lots of banjos. It's in the sticks. It's in the sticks. Yeah. Do you know yeah. where Carthage, Tennessee is? Yeah, I think I've driven through there. Yeah, Carthage. So, so Gordonsville neighbor, neighbors Carthage. Carthage being famously the hometown of the Gores, Al Gore and ah, his father and, nice. and so on. Yeah. So, Amazing. Yeah. So you so you you finish uh, Berkeley. Your dad's proud. He's got to be really proud now because you've taken those skill sets and turned it into something real. You know, re you are in the entertainment business, and he can see his son on the television all the time. That that's pretty great. Um, 
what was the first job you got, the first touring job? Because I've got some names on this list here. Maybe you can kind of like tell us some of those little stories. My first touring job, the first job that took me, at the time I lived in Boston. So I guess the first job that took me out of Boston was <laughs> I, I couldn't have gone farther away. If I had gone any farther away, I would have started getting closer. Because the first job that took me out of Boston was a gig with a Cantonese pop artist named Fei Wong. And we uh, went and rehearsed in Hong Kong for six weeks, seven weeks, and then proceeded to do about a three-week U.S. tour, and then followed that up with about a month-long run at the Hong Kong Coliseum. So, uh, so yeah, we did that. And it was funny because when I got that gig, I was not familiar with Fei Wong, and I had actually heard of the audition through a friend who was a bass player who wanted me to accompany him on the audition. I did. I was fortunate to get the gig, and I was looking at our itinerary, and it was, you know, this arena and that arena and that civic center. And I was like, I've never heard of this person. How are we, you know, I'm looking at capacities, 15,000, 20,000, 16,000. I'm going, who, what, how is this happening? <laughs> and come to find out, all of these gigs were booked in cities with very large Chinatowns, very large Chinese populations. And we were playing, and this was an artist who rarely toured the States. And, you know, so it's like, this is your opportunity to see her. You may never, never see her again. And so, yeah, she was selling out, you know, 15,000 seat arenas here in the States. Good for you. So, so, that was my, a... so that was my first tour. That was my first tour. And I remember being there. I, I wound up on the gig. And another person who wound up on the gig alongside me was a keyboard player named Johannes Wallman. And Johannes and I knew each other from Berkeley College of Music as well. And at Berkeley, the Berkeley Performance Center is where we have our biggest shows. And if, if memory serves, capacity is about 900. About 1,000 maybe. It's a, it's a theater. It's set up like a theater, but it's about 1,000. And I remember showing up to the Hong Kong Coliseum to do these shows in like a 15,000 seat arena. And Johannes just looks at me and he goes, well, we're not in the VPC anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's great. And so what are you like, 23, 24 years old? That's an exciting thing for a young person in their 20s. You're, you know, touring the world and I'm assuming you're single at the time and it's just, you know, meet you in the bar after the show and hilarity ensues. I mean, that's, a, that's just fun. It's a heck of an experience. Looking back at that. It was a heck of an experience. It was a heck of an experience. Um, I saw a lot of things there, and I had a lot of, uh, a lot of times, you know. It's like, hey, Nate, uh, have you ever eaten shark fin stew? Hmm. Yes, <laughs> which is weird because over there it's like a delicacy, and that's just not an experience that you normally have. <laughs> I know. I, I, I always think about the story that Thomas Lang uh, tells about, you know, he's so well-traveled and he goes to China so much and he's telling the stories about how he's eating this delectable thing that he thought was mushrooms and this beautiful brown gravy and it turns out it was chicken eyeballs and, yes. and, and his guests were like, his hosts were like, he loves the chicken eyeballs. Bring him some more. He's like, chicken eyeballs, what? Well, <laughs> and here's the, here's the let, me, let me tag on to that. So I'm kind of squeamish. So when I tried shark fin stew, I didn't even know what it was. They were like, here, try this. And I was like, okay, and I tried it. The, the, the production that I was working with were <laughs> majority Chinese. Yeah. So they would, they would literally, in terms of chicken eyeball, if you ordered, say, a filet of some fish, it would be the whole fish, boom, on the table. And nice. like, I have a thing with eating food that looks like it did when it was still living. Yeah. Like, that's the thing for me. <laughs> They would literally take their chopsticks and pull the eye out of the fish and go, Nate, Nate, um, <laughs> and eat it in front of me, just deliberately trying to gross me out. Now, now, hand in hand with that, see, this is what I mean. I, 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 there are a lot of experiences that I'm so fortunate and so blessed to have had. Is there a time. book coming? You, you got a memoir coming? Mm, with some of the, what do you think? Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> um, so, so it's funny because that's also the time when I learned to uh, use chopsticks because I didn't eat with chopsticks. And I didn't want to be like the, the dumb American asking for a, a fork everywhere because A, I didn't want to be a dumb American, and two, or A and two, what is wrong with me? <laughs> a and, 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 well, I'm doing two, A and two. But anyway, secondly, secondly, uh, I wanted to learn new chopsticks. I wanted to, you know. Yeah. Uh, so I got really good at using chopsticks because the way they served the meals was very much a round table, like, 
here's the dish, boom, and it's a plate of whatever it is. And if your chopstick skills weren't good enough to get off a portion of what that was, everyone else's were, and you got no food. So, yeah. <laughs> so I had to get really good at eating with chopsticks very quickly. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I think I think uh, we all taught our, our, my uh, my boss Al Dean how to use it because he was using. We got convinced him about a decade ago to try sushi, and he was eating it with mm-hmm. a fork. I was like, at least eat it with your hands. But then we, but the, but the, the chopsticks are like it's drumming. There's a fulcrum. There's like it stays put, and then the sure. other one moves. Yeah, exactly, move. exactly, yeah. exactly. And right? it's funny because because you know what too though. Here's what you got to do though too. Like th- by the way, these are drumsticks that someone nice. gave as a gift, right? Uh, they're pens. Oh, nice. Right? Yeah. So, but 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 you can always tell. And if, I'm, if I accidentally out you on this, Rich, I apologize in okay. advance. But you yeah. can always tell because the people who are most comfortable hold them way at the back like this. Yes. Hold them way at the back, right? The like a drumstick. Like right. The people who are like just learned or who don't really know what they're doing, they hold them like real like close like this. And like the second you do that, they're just like, oh, okay, you're new. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always, I always like I, I'm trying to pick up a pen right here and it keeps on sliding out. Yeah. Very, very captivating. I know. <laughs> very captivating. Yeah. Now, love, Jim. I love, here we go. I, just, I love that I happen to have mm. these. I just like sitting in a cup. Yeah. Right there for, for just such a demonstration. <laughs> I love sushi so much, but you got to be careful in Los Angeles because it's there's one in every strip mall, and it really can break uh, break your bank account. I mean, if you go after sushi a couple times a week, it adds up, man. Yeah, yeah. It's not on the. It's not high on the economical food list items. But it is great. Oh, Sorry I got about mercury, right? Well, yeah, you can be like Jeremy Piven and, and get mercury poisoning. Oh, dear. I didn't even know such a thing. I, <laughs> I, I did not know that happened. He ate so much sushi, he got sick. There was too much mercury in his blood or something. It was like, Well, I, well I did, a, I did a, a tour once with an artist, and she basically required, a, so, you know, when, you know to, to people who may not have had the experiences touring, a lot of the time you get post-tour food. You yeah. get on the bus after your date, and there's post-tour food. And uh, she required sushi like every night. So I ate a lot of sushi on that. On yeah. that tour. It got to be a little bit much. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yes, yes. So That's after crazy. that gig, the things start rolling. You know, you get that. That's your first international credit. You're getting a taste of things, getting your endorsements together. Um, when, when do you come to sunny Los Angeles? Oh, not for many years later. Uh, because that would have been... Faye would have been mid-90s, so it was another four years or so before I moved to L.A., four or five years before I moved to L.A., um, and the touring that I had done, it was interesting. Faye was my first tour, and although she was not as mainstream known in the States, she was a huge artist. My next several tours were not of that level, so my next several tours were sort of like band and trailer tours and things of that nature, and so it wasn't like I did Faye and I was playing these arenas, therefore now this is what I do, play arenas. It was not that by any stretch, you know? It was like, therefore now this is what I do, put my drums in a trailer and drive back and forth across the country, yeah. setting them up myself and breaking them down myself and doing gigs with, you know, anyone who will have me. Sure. So, you know, so no, so it's not like the floodgates open and suddenly I had all these amazing gigs. Amazing. Well, I mean, that that really speaks to your, your attitude and your work ethic because there's a lot of people that would be like, hey, this is, I reached this thing and now I've got a writer and I'm eating sushi after the gig. And, and oh, no, I, no, no, no. You know, I'm not going no, no, back to that. I never feel that, that way. <laughs> you know? No, I never, I never feel that way. I never will feel that way. I, I get asked the question sometimes, um, uh, when did you know you'd made it? Oh, yeah, sure. To which I answer, I'll let you know when it happens. Yeah. And everybody, I don't, I don't, <laughs> yeah. I no, no part of me, no part of me sits back and kicks my feet up and goes, "Ah, oh, yes, I've made it." Yeah, I don't think that. You know, I, I, I realize that I'm fortunate to have a gig now. I realize that I'm fortunate to have followed, you know, a certain gig after another, certain gig after another, and it's led me to where I am right now. Yeah. But no part of me, like earlier, you mentioned, you know, how steady the gig on the voice is. Well, I mean, it's it's completely steady until it isn't. Right. Do you right. know what I mean? Um, so it's like when I got the gig on The Voice, when I got the gig on The Voice, like you mentioned, uh, just, a little, just a little over 10 years ago, no part of me thought like, oh, now I've made it. You know? Yeah. Um, that's all. So, so, so I guess my only point is just that everything has been sort of a gradual, like, I'm fortunate to do this now. Gra- but when I was in Boston, it was, oh, I just did a tour. I went to Hong Kong, and then I got back. And then, oh, I did a tour with a known American artist that's more, more mainstream known, you know? Oh, I moved to L.A. Oh, I've got some local club gigs in L.A., which to me, 
was a big deal at the time. I was like, sure. I'm a working LA musician. Oh, I've got a gig with a brand new artist in LA, so I get to play a couple of TV shows. Oh, I've got a gig with a slightly more well-known artist, so we're playing slightly larger arenas uh, or slightly larger venues. So it's just always been constant. At no point was it like I'm here in a van and a trailer. Oh wow, I'm on a TV show. Yeah, it was. It was not that by any stretch. Now, do you do you do you miss the waking up in a different city every day, or do you love the steadiness of like? high-fiving your drum tech and you got your Starbucks and you're like, the, the drums are set up beautifully and you're, you know, you're, you're, you're there in Burbank. And yeah, is, is that the, do you miss the old days of waking up in a different city every day? Or? Well, you, you kind of, you kind of, um, you kind of, uh, how can I put this? You, you, you didn't quite end the question like I thought you were going to. Right, right. I thought you were going to say, like, <laughs> do, you, do you miss that? Or do you enjoy doing this particular TV show? Yes. The answer to that question would be yes. <laughs> exactly. Right. That's exactly right. That's the answer to the question. It's like, yeah. you know, there are certainly, as I sit here right now, I'm looking at a, a concert poster that I, I worked with a jazz artist named Chico Freeman many, many, many years ago. Sure. And I, I used to do this thing where I would get a concert poster and I would, you know, from whatever, from a venue, right? So this one happens to be, wow, this was somewhere in, is that Italian? Yeah, it's Italian because there's a picture of the uh, of the um, Coliseum there. Yeah. But I get I would I would take pictures on the tour. I would get a concert poster and I would decorate it with pictures from the tour around the concert poster. So this is cool. playing Stazione Concertistica, and that's from 1995. Nice. Association Messini's Musica Jazz. <laughs> so <laughs> my my point is. I have a few of these things hanging around the house. Yeah. And so I'll look and I'll go like, oh yeah, that's when I was, so what, 1995 I was on tour with him. So that would have made me in my early 20s. And sure. that's, so, the, so yeah, oh, that's when I was in my early 20s and I'm standing beside the Coliseum. Do yeah. I miss that? Of course I do. Like that was some, those were some crazy times. That was a lot of fun. But now I'm a little older. I enjoy the consistency of being home. I have a gaggle of, of kids. I have a starting five and a kid coming off the bench. Like that's how many kids I have. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. So well, you have six? Yes. I have six. I have six. So, so, nice. so, so, so Nate, we know that you've had sex at least six times. Well, actually two of them I got with my ex, uh, sorry, with, okay, my, with my current right. wife. So, so, oh, so this is your second times. marriage. Only four times. It is. But, See, yeah, but kids? I, only have, I only have proof of four times though. No, this, oh, this, <laughs> you know what, you know what's so funny is that my band, we, we got a, we got like. So you've answered the question: Is this like an adult podcast, or is this like a kid friendly? I can, <laughs> it can be an adult podcast. I was, I just wonder. I was waiting for someone to say a bad word so I could make the determination. Like, oh, well, as, yeah. As soon as Kenny Aronoff found know. out we could say the f word, he was screaming it at the top of his lungs. Yeah. You, you know, Kenny, everything is is incredibly blue. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's like my band is like. You got a drummer, you got a bass player, you got two guitar players, you got a front man, you got a steel guy. We got thirteen marriages between us. It's like wow, the, right. our one, our one no. guitar player really drove up the average with four. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, it's it's tough. It's it's tough. It's it's tough. And if you don't make it a priority, you can easily find yourself in a situation like that. Yeah. You know. And I like to think that from my first experience, I've learned a lot of information that I brought to my second experience. And if anything were to happen, I always tell my wife this now, Nicole, I tell her if anything were to happen and we were to ever not be together, I would just go live in a cave somewhere because I would have come to the conclusion that I just can't do relationships. I just can't do it. So I would just be like, that's it. I'm done. I'm done trying. <laughs> Jim's been married a long time. He's got a gaggle of kids. Yeah. You guys got a lot to talk about. Yeah, three kids. Yeah. Yeah. Three kids. They're fun. They they're can very be. fun. They're very hey, fun. And by the way, Rich, do you edit this? Um, we sure can. No, 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 no. Oh. So far, I haven't said anything that I would. Okay, gotcha. I thought out. you were like, you want me to take out the part about having sex six times? No, no. I, <laughs> At least. I, I, I was just, I'm just, I'm just gonna go far afield right now. Who does Jim look like? Jim, who do people tell you you look like all the time? Bruce Willis. I fat Bruce Willis. I can see, I can oh, sorry, see. Fat Bruce Willis. <laughs> fat Bruce. COVID Bruce, Bruce Willis. I can see that. that. I, I can see that. Back when I, I had hair, I used to look like Dave Coulier. <clears throat> uh, okay, now see, shoot, I don't Nicole know who House. that is. I'm so who is sorry. that? Oh, right, right. Okay, Uncle. Sorry, uh, Uncle Fester. He was, he was on. No, he was on Full House. <laughs> Dave Coulier. Uh, wasn't it uh, jo Joey? That's Joey, right? Or no, is it Joey? Uncle, Uncle Joey? Or am I, 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 no am I conflating? Am I conflating shows right now? 
Okay, sorry. Now, remember no, what I said I think about there was editing? Joey yeah, on all that. this can go. <laughs> remember, remember what I said about editing? Yeah. Yeah, all people this people love this shit, though. When, like when we on step the, on each other and we're like, the Zoom the is failing. They love it. The, I talk a lot about relationships, and we were just talking about Manny Cabo, our buddy Manny Cabo, who was on the show. Yes. You know, it's obviously you're a people person. You never met a stranger. You kept in touch with him. He's got a podcast. He's having you on. Right. Jim and I had Casey Basie on. Casey Abrams was just a, a delightful kid. Oh, or was nice. he on American Idol? Was he on American I'm Idol? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. No. Casey Abrams. He, I think he was on The Voice. He may have been American Idol. Sorry, wrong network. Um, but, <laughs> but still, you could see how my brain was working. Okay, definitely <laughs> clip that. Now, but, so I was kind of like speaking of relationships. Yeah. I believe that you, the, the, the band leader for The Voice, Paul Murkovich. Didn't you meet him back with, you did share together, no? And then maybe some of those Mark Barnett shows, but it's a long relationship. I'm really glad you asked that. This is almost as if when, when, this is almost as if when a guest goes on a show and they give the host the questions that they want the host to ask them so that they can lead into their Mm. bits, because that's like a one, that's one that I I would have asked you. If you said, hey, what do you want me to ask you? I would have given you that. And here's why. So I'm a kid, I graduate college. And I'm out there looking for a gig and I'm seeing guys doing gigs and I'm seeing the guy on, you know, playing with that person and that person. And the biggest question on my mind is how do I get there? How do they get that gig? You know, I remember meeting a drummer who was on tour at the time with Dave Benoit and I asked him, how did you get that gig with Dave Benoit? And he basically said, <laughs> it's the craziest thing too. He basically said, I sent him a, a, a VHS tape. He said, you know, I lived in wherever I lived at the time and I sent him a tape. So it's always like, how do I get a gig? How do I get a gig? So, not surprisingly, I get asked a lot of the time, how'd you get to get on The Voice? Because a lot of people see that guy on the show and they go, well, he's clearly not that good a drummer. Oh, stop like, how, how can I do that? How can I get my do, own? What yeah. do you do to get that gig? Yeah. So who, who does he know? Whose nephew is he? How did he get that gig? The Rich Redmond Show. We'll be right back. Those who are self-employed, especially musicians, think homeownership is unattainable. For Bruce Klein, it took seven years to purchase his first home as a self-employed working musician. But once he did, man, was it satisfying. So he decided he wanted to help other musicians and creatives gain that same satisfaction. Bruce earned his lending license and is now helping people avoid the mistakes he made on his seven-year journey. If you're a self-employed musician, he can help. Go to musiciansmortgage.com, powered by Movement Mortgage. Bruce Klein, NMLS, number 1465948. Movement Mortgage supports equal housing opportunity. NMLS, number 39179. NMLS, consumeraccess.org. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. I tell people I got that gig in 2005 when I met Paul Murkovich. And so what I mean by that is this. Way back when, as you just alluded to, the first time that Paul and I ever worked together was on Rockstar in Excess, which was a CBS show, Mark Burnett, reality, competitive music reality show. And it was on, yeah, it was on CBS and it was on in 2005. And through a series of auditions and so on, the band that finally ended up being the band included Sasha Kudovsov on bass, Paul Murkovich as the MD, and myself on drums. And that core unit from that point had gone on or has gone on to play together with Paul Stanley. We played together with Cher. We've done numerous recordings uh, in town together. And ultimately, as the Cher gig, Mark did the front part of the Coliseum gig, and then I sort of came on for the back. And as the share gig was winding down, sort of the voice kind of came up and Paul kind of said, hey, um, something's in the works. I can't talk about it too much right now, but 
don't make plans for next month. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. And that's, and that's how the voice started, uh, for us anyway. And that's how we wound up, you know, there and then cut to almost, you know, going into our 11th year together. So, yeah, it's important to talk about, when you talk about getting gigs, it's important to talk about relationships. Relationships. And how those things, yeah, how those things, I have, I have two big words in my life. Two, two really big words that sort of become guiding principles. One of them is relationships, because that's the answer to so many questions. Hey, yes. Rich. Hey, man, how'd you get your endorsement with so-and-so? <laughs> it's a relationship. Absolutely. I don't know if your story is like mine. Absolutely. But my story, like, so, so Pearl, Zildjian, Remo, if you were to add it up, like, Pearl, Pearl is a 21-year-long relationship that I've had. Good for you. Zildjian is a 20-some-odd-year relationship that I've had. Yeah. Remo is a going on 15 or 16 year long relationship that I've had. Yeah, and 25 all, all for me, them, crazy. Right, and all of them started with, hi, you have no idea who I am, but I, I wanna do gigs, and when I do, is it okay if I let you know that I'm doing them? That was it, I don't want anything. So I just smart. want permission to let you know, right? So that's relationships for me, like, like that aspect, the relationship with Paul and how that led to the gig. The other word for me is balance. Yeah, balance. balance. Well, I was going to ask you, that was one of the questions that I was like, how, how does a father of, of six who's got a home recording studio that does other gigs with other people is doing a national television show, how do you achieve balance? You got to fight LA traffic every day to get to work. Are you getting your workouts? Are you eating right? Like, what is balance? How does that work? Well, I mean, that's it. I mean, that's, that's it. That's, that's the, that's the um, ever ongoing unanswerable no, never ending question like sure. that's always the never ending question i mean it's like I, I have to give credit where credit is due the reason why i talk about balance is because my friend i have a friend and great drummer um tony diagostine who now lives in new york city but when i met him lived out here in la and i was out here i don't even remember doing what oh i do remember doing what i was playing with dale bozio oh nice and yeah i was playing with dale bozio and tony had come out to see me and we were hanging out and i said so tony I had known I had known him before, but I said, "So Tony, as a youngster trying to figure out my way, what's the hardest thing about being a professional musician? Like, what's the hardest thing?" And in essence, what I'm asking is, "What do I got to achieve to get a gig? Like, what is it going to be? Like, being a really good reader? Is it going to be having the the most chops? Is it going to be meeting the right manager?" And Tony said, "The hardest thing about being a professional musician or achieving success as a professional musician is finding a balance." And I said, balance between what? Yeah. And he said, a balance between everything. And I said, what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> everything, yeah. everything what? So like art and, and then, commerce and health and love. All yeah. All of it. All of it. Yeah. Gigs you like versus the gig that pays the more money, which you're yeah. going to choose. Right. I'm, I'm working my butt off, so I'm making money but I don't have time to spend it because I'm so busy working or awesome. I'm touring all the time. I'm seeing all these great places, but I'm never seeing my family uh, or I miss my favorite restaurant down the street from my house. So it's all a balance. So for me currently it's, you know, great. I'm working on the show and I'm fortunate to be busy, but I want to squeeze in time to get my five-year-old out on the tennis court or my eight-year-old out on the tennis court or, you know, sit down and have sushi with my wife, at night. So, so it's just an ongoing thing. So for example, I'm doing this now, which is a part of my professional life. And when I finish, I'm probably going to take my five-year-old over to the tennis courts. Nice. You well, I mean, even, like that. I mean, you want to spend time with your kids, obviously. Um, but as busy as you are, someone's got to be the quarterback, right? So I'm assuming oh, that, oh, well, the wife, though, I couldn't do any of this without, without Nicole. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the time I'll get like the, how do you do it, Nate? And I'm like, I don't know. I'll forward this question to my wife. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, she's the one. I mean, and especially in this day and age where she's she's not just mom now. I mean, now she's school teacher. Yeah. And now she's, you know, school counselor. And she's everything. I mean, we have our – so here at the house, my 20-year-old Miles is – he's college. So he's – I'm not, you know, so much worried about him. He's kind of like – he reminds me all the time, Dad, I'm an adult now. Dad, I'm an adult. I'm an adult now. <laughs> and I'm like hey, – You mean, so number, you can pay your own I'm bills. Like, I'm like – I'm like – I'm like – in number alone, son. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I never got to say that. Miles is actually really awesome. He's, um, in fact, if I may, he, he's the kid who 
throughout a lot of his education, I was definitely like, uh, is this kid going to ever, is he going to get it at some point? And now he's literally, <laughs> he's, 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 he's a, I did, I wondered. I was. What do you mean get it? Like, a, you know, the quadratic of formula or just like life? Oh, no. I'm thinking like life, life, life skills, life gotcha. skills. Gotcha. Right? This is, this yeah. is my son. I, I love all my kids so much. Am I going to have to like, take so care Miles, of you the rest of my life? My, correct. Miles is the, at the time, Miles w- w- was the kid who would get the turkey out, get the cheese out, get the bread out, put the miracle up on it, make the sandwich, put the bread away, put the cheese away, walk away, leave the turkey on the countertop. And it's like, <laughs> you, were, you were so close. So close. Like, you were so close, right? So, but now, flash forward, the kid is a high school national speech and debate champion. He nice. won two. Well, he won a national title in high school, and he came fourth in another national event in high school. And now he is at University of uh, Sorry, he's at Western Kentucky University on a speech and debate full scholarship. That's great. So he has effectively gotten his ish together. Um, where the heck was I going with all that? Oh, uh, oh we were just talking I about saying, ba- I was balance. Saying, yes, yeah. quarterbacking, quarterbacking. But so who's left? Who's in the house? Is Brandon who's my 18 year old, who's like my computer guy. He and I are working on designing my website together as we speak. Nice. My 14 year old Lachlan, who is my tennis kid. Although at this point he's a tennis coach. He's, he's, he has his own at 14 years old. He has his own clientele and he's actually coaching tennis now. And then my eight year old daughter, Mm. Izzy, who is playing tennis and she's doing her thing. And then my five year old Amelia, who's also playing tennis. (laughs) Can you tell her tennis house? (sighs) And, uh, and then uh, Julian, my three year old. The point of all of that is the 14 and the 18 kind of do their own thing. They're teenagers. But my wife has to juggle the three, the five, and the eight. And when I'm home, occasionally I get to jump in and be of some assistance, but sometimes I'm gone all day and she's got to do all of that herself. So none of that could happen without her, right? So um, so that's all. You know, you ask me who's quarterbacking it. She definitely is. Her name is Nicole and I love her dearly. And if she were ever not here, I'm pretty sure everything about my life would collapse. Well, good for you guys. <laughs> how, how long have you guys been married? Uh, that's a good question. Let's see. I'm what year? Say, what year right, did you I'm, get I'm looking back. Well, I'm looking back. I think it was 2013. Okay. Yeah. 13? So you got like yeah. a seven, eight year. You guys got over the seven year itch. It's good. Yes. 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 Well, and Yes. I think it's, I think it's, <laughs> no, no, I'm just doing that. I know it's so embarrassing, right? You ask people, they're like, what year did you get married? Um, it's such, such, such the typical guy. Again, it's tough to quantify the amount of years you've been married. It's easier to say, you know, I've been married since 2001. Okay, well, I'm going to look it up. I'll and let you do the out. math. And I'm going yeah. I'm I'm to find out exactly so that I yeah. have that answer on lock next time. But, um, yeah. I, I love that. <laughs> well, so, you know, Nate, like every salad's got to have, you got to have oil and vinegar. And that's, mm-hmm. so that's Jim, you know, like, look, I mean, look at my forehead. I, I need some cover up. I got the oily skin. Jim. You come with the vinegar. What's your question? Because I know that you have some left of center questions for our guests every time that I would never think of. Well, the one thing, it goes back to when you're talking about balance and a lot of that comes down to what is the end game? I, I, I have a lot of podcasts with business owners and we always talk about what the end game is. What does it look like? You had mentioned also um, uh, feeling like you've made it. So what is that scenario? what would that scenario be for you? And what, so, is the, what would the end game be for you? We, sure, we, that's, and that's, you know? that's a good question. And you know, it's funny, I've, I've been fortunate to have done a fair few podcasts. And so as mm-hmm. you might imagine, you mentioned doing several yourself, uh, Jim. As you might imagine, you, you do start to get asked the same questions repeatedly. And so mm-hmm. whenever I'm doing a podcast, I sort of look out for like the new question. I sort of look out for like the one thing I've not been asked and I've not been asked that. I've not been asked that. I've not been asked what the end game is. Um, and, you know, I think that if I, if I may say I'm a sports car guy, right? I love sports cars. So let's see. Goals. Move to LA. Did that. Figure out a way to earn a living as a musician. In the process of doing that. Yeah. <laughs> have a really cool hot wife. Done that. Nice. Love it. Yes. Drive a sports car. Done that. So I'm kind of good. So well, we got to ask point, you what kind, because Jim's a car guy. What kind well, of sports uh, car? Yeah. Well, right now I have a Subaru WRX, sorry, a Subaru WRX STI. That's right. my, that's my car. I was an early adopter. I had an 04 Subaru WRX STI 
and I drove it. I drove the wheels off of it. I modded it out until it blew up and exploded. And now I'm in an 18 uh, STI, and I'm loosely holding out as long as we're as long as we're being nerds uh, and talking cars. I'm loosely holding out for that day when I can go and uh, get my 911. But until that happens, I'm 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 stoked with the STI. It's 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 plenty of car. Um, so, but my my only point was just that at that point, I can move on to my goals in my kids. Mm -hmm. So for example, I can move on to looking forward to watching Miles graduate college, looking forward to watching Brandon enter college, looking forward to watching Lachlan make, you know, varsity tennis team when he enters high school next year, things of that nature. So that's sort of my end game is being able to transfer what my wants are to wanting the wants of those closest to me to happen for them, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of more concrete, if I had to say like something sort of um, sort of financial or not even financial as much as like, I don't really have, I have to be honest with you, I don't have a financial end game in the sense that no matter how much money I ever earned, I would never retire. Like I would never stop playing drumming. You know what I mean? Right. Stop playing drumming. Yeah. <laughs> I would never stop. I would never stop drumming. You know, it's like, so, so yeah, so my, my end game is less of an end game and more of like a denouement, if you will. Yeah. Sort of like a watching the watching the, 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 the decrescendo at the end of a piece, which is going to be watching my kids go on and do things. Watching my wife go on and do things, you know? Well, that's I mean, you seem like you have a very full and rich and satisfying life, which is you are achieving that balance, which is incredible. And I know that people, you know, we're cut from the same cloth. We're workaholics in the sense that it never feels like work, which allows us to continue to work harder, which we have because we're working hard, more opportunities come to us and we enjoy every bit of it. And there was one right. night, a couple years back, you and I were both booked to play this little thing at the Viper Room, and I knew you were so serious because you took the time. You gave the bartender your GoPro. He put it up on one of the shelves or something, and you filmed your gig. And I was like, what are you doing? You're like, oh, I just like to study myself, make sure my posture is good, make sure I'm not stepping on the vocal. I'm like, good for you, man, you know? Well, I mean, how many times do we see ourselves do stuff? I mean, it's, it, it could be that. It could also be I want to make sure that – you know, this particular thing that I'm doing that I think looks cool actually looks cool because maybe it doesn't. Yeah. Or, or I might realize like, oh, I tell my students not to downstroke, but look at me, I'm downstroking the whole time there and I didn't even realize it. So a lot of the times it's that, you know. Yeah. I tell my students not to have their pinkies out. Oh my God, my pinkies out right there, you know. So, yeah. How many students are you maintaining right now? Or is it like for me, like I do like a lot of online teaching, but I do like a lot of one and done where it's like, they're like, oh, okay, uh, this guy's got a pretty steep hourly rate. I'm going to write down all my questions and get everything covered in one. Or are you doing like where you're, you're, you're cultivating that relationship and that skill set over a decade with the same kid? No, I don't. I, you know, so I took drum lessons with Grant and – Grant Menifee in, uh, in outside of Baltimore, Maryland. And I remember like every Saturday, 1030, I had my half an hour lesson with Grant. And it went on like that for several years. Yeah. I don't have really any students like that. I have, like you said, like one and dones. And it used to be sort of one and dones because I didn't do the online thing. You see the screen back there. Yeah. That's what I, that's what I, you know, I roll out to use for my online lessons. But I didn't do that for a long time because I was just stubborn and lazy and didn't feel like trying to learn it. And so basically it was like, okay, well, hit me up when you're, in, when you're in L.A. So I would have people coming through and they're on a family vacation and they send the, 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 the rest of the family off to go to Six Flags for the day and they come and take a lesson with me, right? And then they're gone. I don't see them. They fly back to Duluth and that's the last time. <laughs> Fargo. So, yeah. So I still have some of those, uh, several of those. It's just that it's online now. However... Because I've gotten more comfortable with the remote thing, I actually am able to have some regulars. Yeah. So I have about, not a, not a ton, I have about eight regulars. You know, and when I say regulars, I mean people that I see and maybe anywhere from two to four weeks elapse between a lesson. Something like mm -hmm. that. You know, nice. guys I see once a month or, or every, every three weeks or so. Um, so that's been, a, that's been kind of a silver lining out of the whole Sure being at home thing yeah. and also too I'm, I'm i'm fortunate that i have to schedule it you know or i get to schedule it around work right so if i were doing it full time i would much i would love to have more students um yeah you know i think i mentioned earlier my dad is an educator so yeah. i kind of have i kind of have teaching in my dna 
something yeah. that I really enjoy. Yeah, doing. a teacher's fact, heart, man. Teaching, teaching is only. Te- I have to. People always laugh when I say this, but it's the truth. I teaching is a close second to playing for me. If someone said you can only teach for the rest of your life, or you can only play for the rest of your life, I would have to think about it. You know, I enjoy teaching that much. I, yeah. How about this, Rich? How about this? Um, when you're teaching someone something, and you watch them, and they're playing it, or they're working through it, and they they're doing this, and the and then they're slowly getting it. You see the, the crinkle, and then they go, and there it is. Like their that smile, look, yeah. that look when they get it, right? It's that's that's it's like a drug, you know, yeah. watching someone get something. So that's that's the enjoyment that I get out of teaching. That is amazing. I, I, I um, uh, Jim, Jim and I, we commissioned this uh, jingle, and it's coming up. And Jim, you know what I'm talking about? Like, get a really good question for Nate today. And in the meantime, I want to ask one thing. The times have changed since you and I came up through the ranks. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give a young 21-year-old, 18 to 22-year-old drummer trying to get into today's music business? What do we tell these folks? That's a really good question. That's a really good question. And you kind of, you led me one way and then you kind of went left. Because (laughs) one of the questions that I sometimes get asked, which is a sort of a permutation of that question, is what would you tell a 20 year old you if you could flash back and tell 20 year old you something and my standard response for that question is probably nothing because everything that happened whether good or bad led to where I am today and I'm pleased with where I am today so advice that I would have told that 20 year old might have set that path on it maybe a better course maybe but maybe not a better course so that's my answer to that question which you did not ask so I just voluntarily answered a question that you didn't even ask me. <laughs> and I'm gonna, now I'm going to move on and answer the question that you did ask me, which is a different answer. So today, if I have, you know, a 20-year-old student and they're trying to make their way, one of the first things that I say is become comfortable in some sort of home recording environment. Because that's, you know, that might not be the difference in you buying your house in Malibu or not. But it's definitely a good skill set to have because, you know, the days of every artist getting, you know, $2,500 a day studios and hiring them out to record records, I don't, I don't know that those days are ever coming back like they once were, sure. right? And far more recording is moving to home recording. So that would be one, one thing that I would say. Um, and then another thing which you're – quite adept at, which I am trying to learn to be better at, is to obviously develop a social media sort of game, if you will. Sure. Do you have a website, Rich? Do you have a website? I know you have Instagram and you have those things. But do yeah, you have a- just richredmond.com. Okay, because because I don't. And it was only until recent history that Derek, I'm getting a little in the weeds right now, but Derek at Pearl basically said, you know what, Nate? You, you need a website because that's a horrible, that was a horrible Derek is Derek, that Derek Wolf? Was, Derek Wolford? It was, it was no, it wasn't. It was gonna be, but then it just went horribly wrong. Well, you're trying um, to do, sorry. yeah. No, I was good. gonna try to do Derek, but I can't because he's kind of soft spoken, you know. But he has that like, like Southern that Texas, charm, yeah. Texas Nashville sort of thing. Anyway, point being, Derek was basically like, dude. It, 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 essentially, what he said was, if you don't have a website, you're blowing it. I mean, you know, I mean, he didn't put it like that, but that's essentially the gist. And so I'm working on that which is something that if I were talking to a young player today, I would say that's a good, you know, that's a good space to have. Yeah. Uh, to, use, to, to use Derek's terms, he said, you know, you should always have your name.com. Like you should always have it, you know. Yeah. Um, I don't, by the way, right now. But so you're working on, on the, are you working on the .com with your son? I am. I okay, am. great. Brand, okay, so NateMorton.com is coming. Well, no, but see, it's not, which is another story. Um, <laughs> because I, I, the second I said I, 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 that you should always have your name dot com, I actually don't. But um, but it's um, yeah. This is I, it you could be like edit this out. It could be like but, Nate Morton's drums dot com, or it could be Nate Morton dot net. God forbid. Well, but no, you know what it's going to be? It's going to be Nate Drums dot com. Nice. N a d r u m z, like my Instagram handle. And also like my email address. Perfect. And also like my 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 uh, my vanity plate. <laughs> oh my and god! The only, I, I love that. The only thing you got to do is you got to every time you tell somebody you got to spell it out for them. Which is fine. Yeah. Okay. Nate 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 dot drums. 
Let's see if that's available. Because you have an innate right. ability. Well, I'm good. I think I, oh my God. You have an innate ability to affect people in a positive way through the oh way you live your life. I'm sorry. I, I, was, I was not aware that dad jokes were allowed. <laughs> Oh. I, Plus, you can sell your solo so, record. So, so wait, Jim, Jim, wait! I love that you just did that. So my my the fourteen year old the the, the the tennis kid Lachlan, whenever he makes a bad shot or like a blunder or like double faults, that's exactly what I, I go. Doom, 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 oh. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> well, I I mean, man, it, it's you know you got you have so much to offer, and I, and I was even looking on drummerworld.com a couple of years ago. You put. Um, a solo record out and I got to tell people you're like singing and rapping on this thing you are a multi-talent my standout track all dessert diet that's a so good nice, one so nice of you to say a couple of years ago <laughs> I think that record I think that record came out a decade a decade and a half ago it's okay I'm comfortable with my no man you I'm sound great oh, that's awesome yeah well more recently actually I'm involved uh, in a project called Fraud Profits with my best friend Sean Halley and he and I just released a record uh, well, actually, see, I, I'm doing it to myself now. We didn't just release it. It would have come out several years ago. And we were just about to get going pre-COVID. We were just about to start doing our first gigs. Yeah. And then it all went down the drain. And then Sean moved to Austin. Ah. Uh, so, alas, there may, there may be a very long wait before there's ever a Fraud Profits gig. But the record is really amazing, and I'm really proud of it. Great. And, uh, yeah, really stoked that really, – you know, it's interesting. So I got a buddy named Michael. And Michael always says, you know, live gigs are great, but a recording lives forever. Yeah. Once you make a recording, it takes on a life of its own. So even though it may be some time before Sean and I are actually able to do live gigs together, uh, if ever, I'm really stoked that that record exists. It's called Poptosis, by the way, for anyone nice. who's interested. Fraud Profits is the name of the band, F-R-A-U-D-P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S. And uh, the name of the band is called Poptosis. Oh, sorry. Well, the, the real yeah, question is, is, is it on Spotify? Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure if it is because we're old school and so we actually pressed records. So it's on CD oh, Baby. Nice. It may be on Spotify. It may be. You can search it up. Okay. Jim, I saw you doing some research earlier. He's always on, researching. Uh, on, 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 on .coms for me. But, <laughs> I, I was. Uh, NateDrums.com yeah. is available. It is? With an yeah. A. Oh, 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 wait. Are you spelling N A T E? Yeah. Oh, no. It's N8. N8 D R U M Z. That's what I'm that's what I'm using. And Nate Nate Morton is not available. Ah, it's a long so, story. It's a long story. There's probably a guy out there, he's like a surgeon or a baseball player. There's another Nate Morton out there, but the original no, Nate Morton is you. It's not it's not that exciting a story. Okay. It's not that exciting. Well Basically, listen. Jim. Yes. Do the thing, man. It's the random question. Random question. Random question of the day. Yeah. It's that time. We got attention, wow. bed too. Here we go. Who's, who's that? Just guy? like a what, real reality what, what? show. That's like the uh, you put the Barry White plug in on your voice right then. Jim, yeah. turn up that tension, bed. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. How? Here's your random question of the show. Here we go. How do you get in the way of your own success? That's a random question. That's a random question. That's not too I have random. An actual, it's a random. <laughs> it's totally so random. random. He's got a random know, question generator. The way, you get in the, way, the way you get in the way of your own success is by being a dick or by being a <laughs> jerk. That's how you get in the way of your own success. Yeah. How many people, how many people do we know who can't get out of their own way where that's, where, 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 you know, with that regard? <clears throat> oh, we might um, know a few. And, and there, 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 there are several, there, there are several opportunities where, um, the the opportunity is yours to win or lose, and you manage to defeat yourself. You right. know, um, much like well, the Los you... Angeles Clippers last year. You know, <laughs> it's like the only people who could have beaten the Los Angeles Clippers were the Los Angeles Clippers, and they did. <laughs> if you were to have to identify a trait of what you may be doing to get in the way of your own success, what would that trait be? For Nate personally, or just like yeah. theoretically? For Nate. For Nate personally, what gotcha. do you think it might be? Okay, can you? I'm sorry, can you rephrase it? Say it again. If you had to figure out what trait of yours got in the way of your success, your own success, what would it be? Uh, hmm. Present day or entirety of life? Uh, let's do both. <laughs> okay. Um, let's go to the one that I have an answer for first, which is entirety of life. So when I was in college, 
I had a good buddy of mine named Jeff Gallegos. And Jeff is a Barry player, plays Barry sax, arranges horns, uh, does chart writing, super, super talented guy. But back then, at one point, he pulled me aside and he said, you know what? You're a good player, but you're really cocky. That's why no one likes you and no one wants to work with you. This was right? in college. This is in college. Yeah. So it's one thing for an adult. It's one thing for an adult to say, you know, you're you're a little you're a little cocky, or you're this or you're that, because then you walk away going, "What do you know? You're old geezer. You don't know anything." Mm -hmm. It's another thing entirely for one of your peers to pull you aside and say something like that. So that was kind of a, like a like a touch tone sort of moment where where something happened and it changed kind of my outlook, you know, and it made me much more conscious of not being that way or <laughs> You know what I'm saying? It made me more aware no. that, that a certain degree of humility is required to sure. get on, you know? Um, so that would have been the thing that I would have been doing at that point to have, get, to have gotten in my own way. Um, today, how do I get in my own way? Today, I allow myself to be too easily distracted by things. So, yeah. you know, I don't know if that's, a, I don't, if that's a profound enough answer. But so, for example, it would not be uncommon for me to say, all right, Tonight, I got to get to work on, you know, a particular song I'm working on. I want to I want to work on writing this song. But you know what? I have way on my head. I have all, all these emails in my box. Let me let me just fly through these really quickly. And then the third email is like, you know, check out deals on 9-11. Um, now I'm on car gurus for the next three hours looking at 9-11s for sale. You know what <laughs> I mean? Okay. Right. And so then I get tired and then I go to bed and the song never gets gotten to. So yeah, that's, that's right. my thing. It's like sometimes it's funny. I feel as though, and I'm not, I'm not saying this lightly um, because I realize that it is an actual condition, but sometimes I do feel like there's a little ADHD in me, although undiagnosed. So partly I feel like that lends itself to doing what I do on the show. Like if I were going to mm -hmm. go on tour and – I'm going to go on tour for 18 months with one artist and I'm going to play the same set list every night. Like, which I don't know how much Jason Aldean changes up the set at all or ever if he does or not. But at this point, because my brain is so like, like yeah. I'd probably, I'd have to be doing something else. I'd have sure. to be like reading a book at the same time or doing something because my brain is now used to and conditioned to getting 22 new songs a week. Right. Yeah. Nice. So in that regard, my ADHD, I feel comes in handy. The negative way, right? The negative way, however, is that I am easily distracted. So if I don't have multiple stimuli coming at me, my brain starts to look for multiple stimuli, and then it's easy to take me away from what I my intended thing. Yeah. So that's that's kind of an over answering, and I apologize. For no, that. I, I I can see so that. That, that, that would be it. So, Which, woo, the voice of God. I, I lost my uh, microphone. No, you had like a big. There was like a big verb on there for a second. Got me? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but you have like a huge verb on you now. I feel like I'm in real he's genius got... where they where they put the check, thing check, in the dude's ear and he's hearing the voice of God. This is God <laughs> shit. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Oh my god. You know, here's the thing. You know what's so funny? We are some old dudes. Because if I were doing a podcast with like a twenty one year old right now and I made that reference, like it. they go, uh, yeah. yeah. But Nate, I love this. You know exactly Nate, have you had the big five oh <laughs> yet? I'm close, man. Nice. I'm not there yet, but I can see it from here. Yeah, I'll I did mine there. last July. So we're all kind of around, yeah, kind of around the same era, you know. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be 50 this year. Yep. Big, big plans? You got, you want to do something like, you know, like uh, uh, go somewhere, eat a particular <sighs> type of cake? No, you know, none of that. In fact, here's the funny thing. So 50, that might be different it might feel different or more significant but my wife so she knows me very well and so when i have a birthday cake i either have the number one on it just the single number one yep. or one candle or she'll put three six five because either the number one because today i'm exactly one day older than i was yesterday right mm -hmm. which is the same thing that i'll be tomorrow which is the same thing that i'll be the next day <laughs> or 365, which is, this is how many days it's been since I've had a cake on this day. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, that's the way I think about it. Sure. So I just feel like it's just a, just, again, it's just a progression, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah. 
yeah. mean, to be to be fifty and be above dirt, and it's like I, you know, you're going, you're shooting for balance, and I think you've really achieved it. And there's tons of great takeaways and insights here. Uh, the NateMorton.com or a version of it is coming. Your landing website is coming. But if somebody wants to take a lesson with you or send you an email or some praise, do you got something for people to find you? How do you like to be found? I'm everywhere. I'm everywhere. Like, like I'm annoyingly everywhere. So my email address is Nate Drums, which is N and the number eight, D-R-U-M-Z yep. at earthlink.net. Yes, because I am old. Earthlink.net. That's right. <laughs> at least it's not AOL. Nate Drums, N8, D-R-U-M-Z at earthlink.net. And should you forget that, I have a handful of drum cam videos that are up. And so at the end credits, all my contact information is there. My Instagram is there as well, which is Nate Drums, N-A-D-R-U-M-Z. That's what I am on Instagram. And uh, yeah, I'm on Facebook at uh, facebook.com slash Nate Morton Drums. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I'm everywhere. I'm kind of annoying. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. No, I love it. This Drums.co is, is, is not taken. Dot co. N8 drums.co. I mean, God forbid the people that have di- dot co's Jim, dot Jim, orgs. No, wait, oh, wait, but no. Jim, Jim, do you so dislike Nate Drums, like N8 drums dot com? Like, do you so dislike it that you're constantly trying to come up with alternatives? Is this your subtle I way of think- being like, yo, bro, <laughs> Nate Drums dot com ain't it? That ain't it, bro. I'm just wondering if you'll ever, you'll ever, I'm concerned for your well-being to having to explain that it's with a Z every time. Yeah. But it's with a Z everywhere though, every time. Like I said, it's even on my tag, on my license plate, on my car. Yeah. He's going for consistency there. When he gets his yeah, 911, I'm, he's I'm, good. I'm trying to stay on brand here, Jim. He's, I'm staying on I brand. Got I got you. And, and, and he's, wearing, he's wearing a hoodie. And I got to tell you, I always thought like as kind of like a somewhat of a fashion guy, I was like, uh, hoodies are mailing it in, man. But during this COVID thing, I have gotten so many hoodies and I am loving them, man. And there's different price ranges and different colors and different materials. And, but as long, my, gotta, my commitment is I got to wear my skinny jeans because I didn't want to blow up during COVID. You know what I mean? So I'm rocking. And, okay, now. I got to say, I want to tell you something funny. I want to tell you something funny. And this is, again, here's the thing. People make the world go round. Difference, difference is a wonderful, wonderful thing. My uniform is Adidas sweats. Nice. Typically, now these are my slippers, so I'm just in the house today. But typically my Pumas, typically a T-shirt with some sort of thermal on under it. Yep. And if it's cool, a hoodie. Yeah. And I'm always, I tend to always be wearing some sort of cap. It's either my Adidas tennis cap or it's like a Kangol or something like that. And I just, I, I have, so Rich, again, you're a very stylish bloke. My <laughs> wife asked me, she said she saw, she saw, she saw Rich Redman on the calendar, Rich Redman chat. And she was like, oh, what's Rich Redman chat? And I was like, oh, I'm trying my buddy Rich Redman. He's real cool, you know? And I sent her like a picture of you. And it's like the one when you're like, well, everyone is the one when you're like looking cool. But you're just like... <laughs> And you're like, you're like sitting on your kick drum and you're wearing like a big old long scarf and like your hair is all perfect. You look pretty like shaved. And I, so I sent a picture to her and then I was like, you know what? I might not be stylish enough to talk to Rich. Like, I, don't oh, no, you I, I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm chic enough to talk to Rich. Now, let me tell you the funny, I'll give you the, the, the dumb philosophy behind it. Okay. Are you ready? And this well, is just Jim's me. wearing and again, camo. So and again, and again, oh, geez. and again, this is a rich. I'm reading a modern drummer. Hold on. Hold on. Give me two seconds. Everybody should carry a giant Thor hammer. That will be the next fashion uh, statement. If you guys aren't watching this, Nate is about 10 feet across the room. He's looking through some drawers. He's got some old modern drummer magazines. About your, about your Thor hammer. Is that an actual Thor hammer or is that a toolbox? No, it is a, I've seen the toolbox, but this is the uh, cosplay version of Mjolnir. I've got a buddy. I've got a buddy in town and his name is Buddy funnily enough Mm -hmm. and buddy has a thor hammer like that but it opens and it's a toolbox and he showed it to me and i was like get the fuck out that's amazing (laughs) (laughs) right we get the first f bomb yeah Yeah. so 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 here's so check this out so this is modern drummer this came out this is the november 1990 modern drummer and this is a studio drummers round table by the way rich this is i'm I'm getting so many stories like so many things are flying into my head i know this could be a long episode I know, right? So the author, I'll get to this second, but look. So I, what I want you to see here is this. There's the round so, table. There's some stylish the LA table. guys, yeah. Right. Now, if you can see this, that's like 
that's like uh, Picaro and Keltner and, and freaking Harvey Mason and all these dudes. And there's Vinny sitting on the couch. Now, those dudes are all wearing like cool duds and jeans and yeah. nice shirts and button up. Vinny has on a muscle shirt, a fanny pack. And hammer pants. Heck, what are those pants? Parachute tennis pants. Shoes and tennis shoes with no laces. Right? <laughs> tennis shoes that are not laced with the tongue hanging out. And I saw this picture even in 1990. And I thought to myself, Vinny Kaliuta is so badass that he's just going, what? What? Yeah. I'm not. What I go? I'm not proving. I'm, I'm in my sweats. I'm chilling. I hear I'm you. Like I don't. I don't have to look cool. I don't have to do anything. And so I just took that as just like that's so badass. And so convert. So like in my band, Sasha, our bass player, he's like the fashion play. Like he knows designers. He can look at. He he knows cologne. He'll someone will walk by. He'll be like, oh, that's so and so, so and so, and he knows how much it costs and everything. I'm so not that guy. Yeah. I'm like I just want to show. I'm in the Neanderthal. I'm gonna show up. I'm gonna play drums. Yeah. Ooga chaka. Yeah, you know, our, our friend Robin Flans wrote that article. I believe we had Robin on. Now, there. now here's the funny thing about that. By the way, uh, by the way, I discovered with the with the with the Adidas sweats, it's basically like wearing your pajamas all day, which is what I did when I was in college. Yeah, I would just roll out of bed in my pajamas, go to class, go set my drums up in the rehearsal space, in the rehearsal room, practice, go home, pajamas. So I basically live in my pajamas. Robin Flans. So now here's the funny thing about that. Robin Flans, I'm not sure if she's still doing it or not, but she herself had uh, like a like a webisode thing that she was doing on YouTube, right. which I was fortunate to be invited to join her on. It was so crazy sitting, talking to Robin Flans, who wrote all these articles that were so meaningful and so important to me in my formative drumming years. Sure. It was the craziest thing. I was yeah. Like, I read the articles you wrote on Jeff, and yeah. now I'm talking to you. This is insane. So, yeah. No, that, it was, I love it. Was it. really funny. It was, it was something else. So. Well, it's so funny. Anyway, we'll, so, yeah, we'll have to do, we'll have to do like, we'll have to do like part two of this or something, you know? No, sure, I know, I know, and I know you got to go. But I have an inability to be fashionable, and, and my wife would just say, no, comfort is your fashion. And I would go, I'll take that. Well, it's not holding. It's not, not holding you back, man. And you, and you got and you have the personality to match, man. I mean, it's so. Yep. I, I, I'm so happy for you, man. And you know, it's so funny. It was like we're we're neighbors. I'm over here with my gal in West Hollywood. I've been here like since March 13th of last year, and I fly back to Nashville to do sessions. And now, Rich, um, shame on you! Shame on you for not telling me that. I did not I, know that. Yeah, I'm. I'm kind of. Well, you know, I've been kind of bi coastal for about eight years. But then well, when this all happened. Hollywood, are you? We're right on Doheny, kind of by the Four Seasons over there, up from gotcha. Gil Turner's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so which is really really mm -hmm. fun. And I got a practice space now. I, I could shed over at Sutter's place, and I got my drums all carted up at Angel City. So you know, I remember talking to you about this about maybe like eight years ago. Yeah, and well, so no, longer ago than that because it was when we met. It was yeah, my, but, I think it was shortly after your your Bonnie Hunt. Track, about a decade like, and that's yeah, decade. that's just because you know of of the sun and the fun and the fact that i love my job you know playing this uh with the same guys for 20 years it's nice to go play the viper or go play the whiskey and cheat on each other a little bit and then you bring that essence and you bring that experience back to your home base you know so it's fun i just did an episode um, i just got an email of when it airs i think it airs at the beginning of march i did an episode of of punky brewster Nice. Right. There's going to be yeah. there's a reboot of Funky Brewster coming for uh, for the Pe Peacock Network. I want to say Peabody for the yeah. Peacock Network, uh, which is like going to be a streaming thing, and kind of the same thing. It's like I love my gig on The Voice. I hope that it lasts forever. I hope that we're chatting about this fifteen twenty years, years from now, from now yeah. and it's sure. still going on. Right. That said, yes, it's fun to get out and 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 do something else and have a fun opportunity doing something. So the Punky Brewster thing was like a total fun, like wacky offshoot that was completely different from my normal gig. So I absolutely relate to you in the sense of being able to, you know, go do the Viper because it's just, a, it's a different energy. Yeah. You know? And then when this all comes back, mm -hmm. I'm going to be playing some smooth jazz. I'm going to do some perfect world entertainment stuff. <clears throat> I might do some big celebrity weddings. I mean, it's, I love it. You know I mean? Might as well. I'm just kind of living in the last two cities for the music business, which is, now, you know. So have you been in LA since Jason was touring or, did you move here? Then COVID happened. Then Jason wasn't working. March fourteenth, I was here from last year, and and, okay. and yeah, and so just kind of like, um, 
Not playing drums every day. I actually took a little break. I mean, now I can shed, which is awesome. But in that time, like, I wrote a TED talk that I want to, you know, bring to the world. And I mm-hmm. do my online acting classes. And I t- study mm-hmm. hosting and improv comedy. And, and, you know, a lot of people think I'm crazy. They don't know where I'm going with this. But I, I am convinced that somehow between the podcast and writing the books and speaking and acting, it's all going to somehow come together. Of course. In, of in course. some well, ways. Always- I only asked because I was just wondering, like, for future, when you do Jason Aldean dates, I was wondering if you would be flying out of here to the dates, or do you need to um, fly to Nashville and take off on the bus with all the guys and then fly back here from Nashville? I was just curious like that. Got me, got me. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a bus band. So when okay. we're, when we're in the thick of it and say, I got like, 12 dates on the books and they're all Thursday, Friday, Saturdays, I will get to LA less in those times. You know what I mean? Sometimes to keep it, you know, keep my relationship happening, I'll pop out on a Sunday out here for 72 hours and then go meet the band. You know what I mean? But this has just been a great thing for just enjoying the sun, chasing some other things, cultivating my relationship. I've been with my gal. She's a fashion designer for three years. And so I, I love it, man. I really do. No, no. Okay. Now, by the way, you just took me on another trip. So your your lady's a fashion designer. You're a fashion plate. So the two of you have to maybe maybe we should do something with this. I'm, I've been maybe <laughs> I should rethink this and we should do something with it. Uh, I can circle back to you on another another time for that. But um, so okay, I see. So Jason's a bus guy. Yeah, it's Nashville's a bus culture. It's like sometimes really? we'll do a thing where we'll like fly out to the West Coast and there'll be a bus waiting for us and we'll knock out some dates right. and stuff. But usually it's right. so tightly routed that it's like, all right, we're going to do uh, Alabama, Georgia, and the Carolina and come back to Nashville and then go down and do Florida, Al- you know, Louisiana and Texas and come back home. Does he ever do like a we're going out for seven weeks straight kind of thing? Do, do, do any Nashville artists do that? Four weeks tops. That's the most. That's cool. A whole That's month. Cool. And that was, and that was years ago. You know what I mean? So many years ago. So, yeah, it's so manageable because I still have that Sunday through Wednesday to play with to, right. to do sessions or teach or all that, you know. Right. Or see fam or, yeah. or you know, eat at your favorite restaurant or oh, totally. whatever. Yeah, sure. Well, course, we'll, well, we'll have to get together when this, you know, when this, when this, hopefully we'll have herd immunity by April and we can all like hug it out. Who knows? Um, but this is so funny. Jim and I are doing a broad New York Broadway's ra- drummers round table, which starts in 10 minutes and my computer is dying. Oh, so, shoot. Oh, so Jim, go, go, I'm going to do a, right, right, Jim, right. I'm going to do a quick, uh, um, we can edit this out, but I'm going to, Render the files, I'm going to shut off, and then I'm going to join you in a few minutes. But now, now we'll just uh, close the episode here. Nate. Sure, go for it. Sorry about that. Nate, this has been incredible, man. Thank you for so much for all the insights, and I know people are going to love this. We might have a couple of people that are like, Redmond's not talking enough about gear and about diddles, which means this is not the podcast for them. But, uh, but man, it's just so great to see you. I'm glad you're doing so well, man, and you keep inspiring all of us. Well, I'm very fortunate, Rich, for, for, for both the things I get to do professionally and the things I get to do with my family and for getting to chat with you and Jim today. So, for sure. Very Man, good. balance achieved. Jim McCarthy, as always, buddy, thank you so much for your time and talent. And to all the no listeners, problem. guys, we appreciate it. I got an email address for you, the Rich Redmond Show at gmail.com. And as always, subscribe, share, rate, and review. There's a million podcasts, and that helps, literally helps people find us. So keep coming back for the good stuff. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Nate. My pleasure. Peace, guys. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.